So um, let's move on to the reason why we're all here to ask the author. So uh, today I'm delighted to hand over the facilitation of this event to Claudine Tinellis. Welcome Claudine. You want to switch on? Hello, hi. Sorry again for my fumbling about. No problem. <laughs> if you like listening to podcasts and discovering new Aussie authors, you should subscribe to Claudine's Talking Aussie Books. You can see the, the banner behind Claudine there. Um, and that's available wherever you would normally listen to podcasts. Uh, and I think you've got some interesting authors coming up. We'll talk about that a bit later. Finally, I'd like, also like to mention that Claudine also writes and is in the pro process of establishing her own career as an author. Claudine is going to tell us a little more about Sarah and her heartwarming new book, Symphony for the Man and What Sparked the Story. So um, I'll hand over to you now, Claudine, to, to introduce Sarah and uh, um, looking forward to lots of discussion about the genesis of where this book came from. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much for the warm introduction, Christine. Hello and welcome to everybody who's joining us out there this afternoon. I'm really delighted to be partnering with, with Randwick City Council once again to facilitate such a wonderful event. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce Sarah Brill and her latest novel, Symphony for the Man, published by Spinifex Press earlier this year. Growing up in Perth, Sarah began writing at the age of 15. Whilst initially focusing on writing for film and radio, her first novel, Glory, was published by Spinifex in 2002. After her children were born, Sarah became interested in sustainability and permaculture, completing a Masters of Sustainable Built Environment in 2017. And this led to her current work in organics diversion for local government. Incredibly, Sarah works full time in this role and writes around her family and work commitments. Sarah lives locally with her husband and sons and Symphony for the Man is her second novel. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Sarah now. Hi Claudine. Hi Sarah. Um, first off, congratulations on the publication of this wonderful new book. How are you feeling about it? Uh, I feel really good actually. I think it's always really nerve-wracking when you first publish a book that uh, you haven't quite finished it or you could have done better, but um, people have been reading it and letting me know how they feel and um, the response has been really positive. So I feel better and better each time I get a text or a Facebook message saying someone's read it and enjoyed it. Yeah, and absolutely. Yeah. Fantastic. Now, um, this was a beautiful read and I am unlikely to forget it anytime soon. It was poignant, it was heart achingly real and yet uplifting at the same time. It's a real testament to the realities of homelessness and the often unseen people in our society. So Sarah, for those who haven't read it yet, can you tell me a little bit more about the story? Sure. Symphony for the Man is a story about a homeless man called Harry who lives um, in a bus shelter near Bondi Beach. And, um, and the story of a woman who's not named in the, in the book and she sees Harry from the bus and decides she's going to write a symphony for him. She doesn't really have any um, musical background to do that. So um, instead she starts to explore symphonic music and she introduces Harry to it. And I think the book then is about how it, how that process adds to their lives in, in different ways. Yeah, as I said, absolutely poignant and, and so real in so many ways. So could I ask you what actually inspired you to put pen to paper and write this story? It was a really long process, this book, and um, it started with the Kate Grenville uh, writing workshop and Kate's process was to, to just capture little bits of your life. And at the time I was living in Bondi, and I was working in the city and I caught this bus through Bondi Junction every day. And so I was probably writing little bits that I saw along the way for this workshop. Um, there was a homeless man living in a bus shelter then. It was uh, late 90s in Sydney. We were getting ready for the Olympics. Um, so I, I grabbed a whole bunch of little bits from that time. And then um, a year or so later when Glory was being published, I felt like I needed to write a new book. So I got those little bits out and that, that formed the basis of this story. 
Yeah, wonderful. So the book is told from two points of view. We have Harry the homeless man, as you've said, and the lonely girl who at the beginning of the novel is living on welfare payments and struggling to find her place in the world. As you said, the girl is unnamed, although Harry calls her Symphony Girl. Can you tell me why you didn't name her? Um, I, I think that changed, you know, the writing process was so long, that idea of her being nameless changed a few times, I think. So initially, um, I didn't really think about it. She just wasn't. That's just how I wrote mm. at the time. She, she was not named. Uh, we tried a draft during the editing process naming her and um, and we decided not to but um, we all liked it better when she was unnamed because quite often in our society it's the homeless people who aren't named and in this book Harry is very much named um, so we thought it was nice to leave her unnamed. Indeed Although I must say, it almost feels a bit like a metaphor for her existence as well. She kind of flies under the radar. She doesn't really have any friends. She lives this really solitary, lonely existence. So it kind of fits really. I mean, I wondered if you had done it on purpose or whether it was just the way the story unfolded. I think, um, I don't think I did anything initially on purpose with this book, you know, because it was such a random way to come up with a story. But um, as I moved through the story and worked the story, I liked that she is really only one bad day away from being Harry. Mm. You know, that there's not much that separates them. And, and she's, she's almost on a knife edge that she could fall off at any time. And I, I liked that, that aspect of her and that idea then of her being interested in Harry. Yeah, fantastic. Now, as you mentioned, the book is set in 1999 um, at a time when Sydney is preparing for uh, to, to host the Olympics. And for me, there was that jarring juxtaposition of an affluent city preparing to welcome visitors from all around the world, putting on its best um, outfit, so to speak, um, whilst people are living on the streets, homeless and hungry like Harry is. Um, was this a deliberate ploy on your part or was it really that you were just documenting things that you were seeing at that particular time? Um, no, because again, the editing process was so long, I thought again about where it should be set and what time. Mm. Um, because obviously with 1999, we've got CDs and things that were so important then that aren't important now. Mm. Um, and uh, I really wanted to stick with that time because of two reasons. One is the Olympics coming and, and Bondi was a big focus for the Olympics and they, they did clean it up prior to the Olympics, so people were moved on. And the other reason were there were some changes to funding structures for mental health around that time. That meant um, a lot of the halfway houses were not funded. So people were going to um, mental health clinics or hospitals, but there wasn't really any support for them when they came out. My memory is that increased the sort of homeless issue at that yeah. time. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Now, Symphony Girl goes out of her way to do something very nice for Harry, as you've said. Not only does she decide to write him a symphony, but she leaves a Beethoven CD for him, along with the odd item of food um, every now and again. Um, yet she herself has so little. Um, so I wondered, was this uh, her attempt at forging some kind of human connection? Yeah, I think she has that sort of need that a lot of us have when we see someone struggling that we want to help. I'm not sure, I mean, she lives really tightly, but I'm not sure she sees herself the way we do. Yeah. I think she's a little used to the way she lives and she just knows she has to keep everything under control, but, but I don't think she sees herself as being as close to Harry's situation as, as the reader might. Um, so I think she sees herself more in a position to be able to to offer some kind of kindness or help to someone she sees struggling. Yeah. If Harry is perplexed by her behaviour, he doesn't let on, but she's not the only one that sends random acts of kindness his way. I mean, there are notable examples of people in amongst the throngs that give Harry a wide berth. For example, the kind librarian, the, the Vietnamese restaurant owners and the cafe worker, even the caseworker that Harry absolutely hates. I mean, it seems to be more of an exception rather than the rule. And I have to say to you, reading your book made me feel slightly ashamed, I have to say, um, ashamed that there are people out there roaming our streets um, who suffer in this way um, and yet so very few people um, actually help. 
So I wanted to ask, did you have anything, you know, ha had, has that been your experience, do you think? Um, that we're not very helpful to the people yeah. around us that need help. Yeah. Because I think we're probably a little bit unaware of how many people around us are really struggling. Mm. What the thing that I've noticed with homelessness in the more recent years is that a lot of it's hidden. Back in the late 90s, early 2000s, we didn't really talk about hidden homelessness that I recall. We were, well, I was really aware of the men on the street, but um, now what we're seeing is, is families and, and women in their 50s who are um, rapidly becoming homeless and, and they're a little more hidden from us and not as visible. So that's kind of what I think about these days with homelessness. Yeah. Uh, I feel like I've lost the question there. <laughs> That's all right. Um, it's been more than um, 20 years on from the time frame of the events of this novel. And we're currently, as everybody knows, we're in the midst of this global pandemic. Do you think COVID-19 has served to highlight the plight of people like Harry, Harry and Symphony Girl even further? I think it's going to. I think the next year is going to be really tough for a lot of people. Mm. Um, I mean, I dread to think, I hope it doesn't happen, but I feel like we could be... Um, seeing a lot more people who really need a lot more help. Yeah, absolutely. I want to talk about Harry's CD, the one that Symphony Girl gives him. Um, it's a Beethoven symphony called Eroica. It's a symphony that's in four parts. And just like the symphony she's trying to write for Harry, um, it seems to me that it forms a motif throughout the story. So I wanted to ask you, why was it important for you to refer to this particular symphony? Um, I did a lot of research around symphonic music and Beethoven's third was was held up as one of the best examples of the tradition symphony. So that's the one I used. I, I liked the name um, and it's a really rousing piece of music. I, I thought it was appropriate. I listened to it a lot. Very as long. Book. <laughs> it was about an hour long, isn't it? <laughs> I just had it on all the time in the car every time I got in or yeah but it was a lovely piece of music to write to really yeah fantastic now heroica means heroic is that correct yeah hero so he was originally going to call it Napoleon he wrote it for Napoleon but then Napoleon upset him he wasn't happy with some of the things Napoleon did so he changed the title yeah brilliant um, and I'm guessing that it's no coincidence then that the book is structured in four parts. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Sure. So I, I structured the book um, in the four parts, like the classical symphony. You know, the, I felt that the symphony is a bit similar to the novel. If you're looking at uh, comparing writing and music in that the size of the, of the piece. Um, I couldn't mimic a symphony exactly, you know, a symphony has very structured parts with fast and slow and, and things. So I couldn't quite get that and still tell my story. Mm. But that's the place that I started in terms of structuring the story. Yeah. So you mentioned that you did some research on, on, on obviously music and, and symphony. Um, was there any other research that you had to do for this novel? Uh, well, when I went back through editing, I had to check to make sure I got all my facts right around 1999. Did we really have mobile phones back then? Those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, with the homelessness, I didn't do any deep research, but it's, it's always been an interest of mine. So I collected newspaper articles and, and I had um, spoken to people around homelessness in, in other ways. So um, that was already kind of there, that interest. Mm. Uh, a lot of listening to classical music, a lot of research around classical music. Yeah. Are you a, a musician by any means? No, not really. I'm pretty similar to Symphony Girl. I could play a bad version of the release if you ask me to. <laughs> That's more than I can do, let me tell you. <laughs> I can't even play one note, I don't think. Not even chopsticks, I don't think. <laughs> So that's fantastic. Now, I was hoping that we were going to have some questions um, uh, for Sarah to answer at the moment. There doesn't seem to be anybody um, asking anything at the moment, but if you could think of some questions that you wanted to ask Sarah, just make sure you pop them in the box there and, um, and then I'll throw open uh, the floor to questions as soon as we've got a few in there. So I'll just keep on going at this point. Um, so Sarah, I understand that the book has been optioned for film by Spark Plug Films. 
tell me about that process and what, if any, involvement will you have with the production? So um, I was really lucky that Mark from Spark Club Films, who I think I saw his name there today, um, read a, um, a draft, not quite the final draft of the book, but he met my editor, Pauline Hopkins, at Melbourne Film Festival. I think they were doing a little bit of speed dating between publishers and producers and and um, Mark's approach on the day, rather than listening to everything Pauline had, was to tell her what he was looking for, what sort of story he was looking for. And um, Pauline didn't have anything in front of her that fit what he was looking for, but she had been working with me on Symphony for the Man. So she mentioned that to him. He read it. It was something that he was interested in looking at. So that was really lovely for me. Um, and yeah, so he's optioned it. We had a chat a few weeks ago. It sounds like they're well into the first draft now. And my involvement there is just to assist in answering questions if they have them. Um, we had quite a long conversation about backstories of characters and, mm. and things like that. Yeah. In preparing for this interview, I did read a couple of um, comments about your book and it's um, the fact that it's, it lends itself quite well to adaptation on the big screen. Um, and so I wanted to ask you, um, if you were to nominate actors to play the lead roles, who would they be? Now, I know this is probably just fantasy, but like, who would they be? Who would be your ideal Harry and Symphony girl? I don't know about the girl. I think she could be played by a lot of different characters. Yeah. Um, and well, the, the man, we don't have too many male Australian actors, do we, in that age category? So uh, Hugo Weaving would obviously be ideal. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think Mark, uh, I think Spark Plug are already working with Hugo Weaving on something else, as I understand it. Who knows? <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so terrifically, we've got some questions here um, for you to answer, Sarah. And Anna Karina asks, what were all your jobs? Uh, hi, Anna. <laughs> Anna knows some of my jobs. Uh, I used to work uh, as an edible gardener. Oh, wow. That's so, um, so I started off playwriting and uh, that wasn't getting me by financially. So I also worked as a, a legal secretary mm -hmm. or attempt secretary, but that turned into legal secretary. Um, then we moved to the Netherlands. So I, I worked uh, for the Joint Airline Authority for a little while, writing a newsletter for them. Um, and then back in Australia, after I had my children, I worked as an edible gardener. So I ran my own business worked in primary schools and private gardens. I worked for Oz Harvest and a commercial company who wanted a garden in their workspace. Mm. Um, and then after my master's, I moved into local government, which is yeah. where I am now. And so in the time that you were doing all these wonderful jobs, were you writing? Uh, it's interesting that, I mean, the kids made it hard to write. Definitely prior to children, I balanced writing and working. Uh, the children, there were moments and then there were moments of not writing. Yeah. When I was gardening, I think the gardening was so creatively satisfying that I didn't need to write as much. Mm. So um, I did write, but I didn't have a stronger desire to write as I do now. Yeah. That my work is not as creative. Yeah, indeed. We have another question from Di here who asks, Sarah, what is your daily writing process and are you a planner or a pantser or a plotter or a pantser? <laughs> I'm definitely a planner. Um, I, I would love to say that I write every day, but these days I don't. It, when I'm in a good uh, phase, I'll write in the morning first thing for a short period of time. I'm quite a fast writer. Um, when I'm writing a new piece, I try and set myself word limits every day. So I'll write, even if it's only 100 or 200 words, mm -hmm. just something every day to start moving that forward. At the moment, just because of uh, work and family, I find escaping for a weekend is the most productive thing for me to do. So just been away for two days with a friend and, and then I just wrote for 48 hours, really. 
yeah. and haven't written since. <laughs> <laughs> That's life, isn't it? Yeah. Now, Marie McMillan says, how long did it take to write Symphony for the Man? Were there many changes during the editing process and have many copies been sold? And what are you writing now? Lots of questions in there. Lots of questions. So, I mean, that whole process from when I first started to, to publication is a horribly long time. I think about it's 22 years. But, of course, that wasn't consistent work. It was on and off. Um, the first draft probably only took about three or four months to write, but then it was left and, and returned to. Um, and the editing, it did change a lot, actually. Um, I always had the two voice structure, but I think I initially wrote it in first person from the girl's point of view. Yeah. So I redrafted it to third, uh, which was a really freeing process. I really enjoyed that drafting process. And then there were some really strong structural changes that Spinifex requested. Mm -hmm. And they also um, suggested some quite significant changes to the female character. Mm -hmm. So her, um, I mean, her character stayed the same, but some of her story changed a lot. She wasn't, I had her working in a CD shop and, um, and so that changed to the music school in the final drafts. Yeah. And now I'm working on a um, coming of age story. It's really fun, 16 year old main character. Mm -hmm. um, Glory was a, also a teenage character, but that's a really harsh story. Yeah. This is a much lighter um, story that I, I've really had a lot of fun um, drafting. I'm at the second draft of that now. Yeah. Uh, that also has some interest but I haven't signed an option agreement yet but there is some interest in that one being adapted for film too and um, the last bit I think of that question was how many books have I sold and yeah. I have no idea <laughs> <laughs> everyone asks that but I just don't know I don't know if I'm meant to keep a tally but um, I think that spin affects this business and they'll let me know in due course yeah I'm sure but I guess you know you mentioned earlier when we started talking that you've been pretty happy with the way that it's been received i mean and that's a re that's a really good indicator yeah i mean yeah it's an it's been interesting because glory was hard i think for people to read a lot of people really struggled reading that book some people really liked it but others found it difficult whereas this one seems um to be a lot more joyful for people to read and i've had people i don't know contact me as well this time which has been really nice that's lovely. Well, um, we've got a few more questions uh, for you to answer. So Steve Curran says, can you tell us a little bit about um, the writing process? I think you've already done that. Um, how many hours in a day would you write typically? Yeah, I, I just don't get, I, if it was in a perfect world, I'd probably write the morning and then I'd go off and do other things. But mm -hmm. because I'm working full time and really busy at the moment, I I don't get much time. I might get a little bit in the evenings yeah. Um, or I get that solid block. And when I'm away and I'm doing a writing weekend, I'll get up at seven in the morning and I'll write, I'll maybe take half hour breaks yeah. or an hour in the afternoon to walk. But, but we write from the moment we get up to about nine o'clock at night. Yeah. So you don't typically have a daily word count that you would work towards? Uh, I might if I'm in the process of drafting a new, um, book but at the moment I don't yeah if I was if I was writing a new book I would be aiming for 500 words a day yep <laughs> not always succeeding yeah I'm and trying not to too. beat myself up if I don't yeah absolutely so did you mention how many drafts you did for this book or for Symphony for the Man uh, Symphony for the Man gosh look Probably before it got to spin effects, I would have done uh, three significant drafts mm. and then <clears throat> maybe four. And then after them, maybe two more. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a lot of work writing. It's a lot of hard work. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I think it's Birgit would like to ask you if you would read a little bit of one of your favourite parts of the novel. <laughs> Do you have a favourite bit? All right. 
I've read this one before for a podcast, so I apologise, but it's marked because I wasn't prepared for that. How much time do you think we have? How much should I read? Oh, I could, yeah, a few minutes, I guess. When Harry opens his eyes again, he's lost to the stars. He's lost his way. It's dark and cold and he's not sure where he is. He can't hear the ocean, can't hear anything. He doesn't feel uncomfortable though. Sure, it's cold, the ground beneath him is like an ice block, but he doesn't hurt anyone. He feels no pain. And then there's something warm. At first he can't work out where it's coming from, just something warm that makes him feel good and cozy. It's piss, his piss, running down his leg. Harry comes to realise this, but he doesn't care. It feels good and warm and that's all that matters. And then there's a voice that ruins it all. You're an accident waiting to happen, huh? Harry moves his head to try to see where the voice is coming from. An accident waiting to happen. Harry turns to see his boots near his head, bloody grime. Harry closes his eyes. He doesn't want to see bloody grime just now. Harry opens his mouth to speak, but it's all dry and rough and he can't get any words out. Bloody Brian reaches down with his big hairy arms and suddenly Harry is on his feet. Harry stumbles a little until he regains his balance. An accident. Fuck off. Harry's got his voice back. He feels the last of his piss run down his leg, but that warm, good feeling has gone. He tries to focus on Bloody Brian standing there before him. He tries to think of a way out of the situation. I hate me brother and me sister. Actually, Harry hasn't thought about his brother and sister for a long time, but it's the only thing he can think to say. Bloody Brian likes it when you talk. He likes to know what you're thinking. He says it again. I hate me brother and me sister. If he can keep bloody Brian talking, then perhaps the inevitable can be avoided a little longer. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you for that. So I have another question here for you. The event promotion mentions that the book concept was sparked by writing a course with Kate Grimble, which you talked about a little bit earlier. But this attendee would like to know if you could tell us a little bit more about that course. Sure. It was really fabulous. It was um, over a few weeks and we went every evening for um, two or three hours. And Kate's process through that workshop was to just gather bits. So we um, took lines. I like that section of the book because that line about hating his brother and sister, I got that from a guy on the train um, when I was well into writing the book. So I kind of kept that process up. But I would walk through the park and if I heard a good piece of dialogue, I would write it down, I carried a notebook and we would present maybe 10 of these little snippets every week. And we did that for three weeks. And then Kate had us write them all down and cut them all up into separate ones and we chose the ones we liked. And it was a very kind of random process of then looking at each snippet and saying, well, that feels like a beginning bit. And that feels like a middle bit and that feels like an end bit. And we just put them into these three categories. And from there, we wove the story out of that beginning, middle and end of, of just bits. Um, and through that workshop, Kate talked about writing and her writing and other things as well. Um, but that was the main process that we were working through. Fantastic. So thank you for that question. Now, another anonymous attendee has, says, has asked, you've written a play before. Now, while Symphony for the Man has film interest, do you think it would be, it could be adapted for the stage? Mm, never thought about that. Mm. I really um, haven't put a lot of thought into um, theatre lately. It feels um, like a really hard, like theatre, just, you just need so much space around you to really construct something on the stage whereas in a book I feel like I can just hold that one narrative voice quite clearly in my head despite what else is going on in my life. Um, I kind of can imagine it on the stage. <laughs> yeah maybe because you know it's a very um, small piece there's not a lot of characters. Yeah. Uh, yeah could maybe work. Yeah indeed I'll oh, watch this space then. So Lee Russell says, how do you collect your ideas? In a notebook or do you keep them on your computer? And how many, you know, how many ideas do you have at any one particular time? So many ideas. <laughs> um, I have one main book at the moment that I gather everything in. It's a different page for each different thing that I would like to work on. 
and um, then I have little bits of paper around the place that I grab. I, I was just doing a workshop for work and um, the facilitator said some of the best, the greatest speeches have greatest silences in them, something like that. I have to write that down, you know, those sort of things, but they're in random places that sometimes I find and sometimes I'll just be forgotten. But I do have one, my one main book that kind of sets out all my projects that I'd love to be working on when I have time. Fantastic question, thank you. And um, what started you writing? Uh, you mentioned a workshop uh, with Kate Granville. Did you did that help in your writing career? Do you think? Because that was quite some time ago. Uh, no, I started writing really early. I was a teenager at high school, um, and I started writing because my um, theatre arts teacher really annoyed me. <laughs> and, <laughs> I like that. We, we were doing a, um, we, she asked us to devise a play and we came up with an idea I thought was fantastic and she rejected it. I was furious. <laughs> and I went home to uh, my family and my sister, who's five years older than me, was writing at the time. She was writing plays. I think her high school teacher got her into that. Mm. And she said, well, if it's such a good idea, why don't you just write it? And uh, at the time, we had a fabulous kind of support network for young playwrights. So I did write it, and that got me off to a National Young Playwrights Conference in Sydney. And then I was kind of hooked on playwriting after that, and I wrote a lot mm. there and then through um, university and after university. So that's where it started. But if you see a writing workshop with Kate Grenville, you kind of jump at it, don't you? <laughs> Indeed, absolutely. So Kirsten has asked, did you draw on a personal encounter to write symphony? I mean, you mentioned that you'd seen, you know, a homeless man, just like Harry, on your bus trips um, when mm. you were living in Bondi. Um, she also asks, how much like the female character are you? And did you know a Harry? And was it important to you to finish on a high note, no pun intended, in these post Game of Thrones times? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. All right. Big question, Kirsten. So um, uh, let's start. I, when I first started writing the book, no, I didn't have an encounter with the Harry. I, I had observations, but not an encounter. But the piece that I read, with the line about hating his brother and his sister, that came uh, through the writing process. My eldest son and I, we were bike riding across the bridge for a bike riding day. And so we hopped on a train early in the morning to get to North Sydney and um, on the train was this man and he sat with us and um, I remember looking at my son who was about 12 and his eyes just got bigger and bigger as this man talked to us all the way into Central because he really hadn't been faced with someone like that and you know it's very early in the morning he'd obviously been out all night he, mm. he was younger than my character but as he talked I kind of realized that there was Harry in front of me you know, this was 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 my character in a sense and and I just love that interaction it really kind of um, motivated me to keep working on the book how much the female character is like me maybe Kirsten has some ideas about that but um, I was speaking to some people uh, in park on Sunday who'd read the book and one of them said that loneliness in that character did that come from you moving up because I lived in Sydney for a year or so when I was 20 and um, I said no no not that the love of circular key did but but not the loneliness but I thought about it afterwards and I think I answered too quickly I think it probably did mm. that that aspect of her that being away from home and in a new city and then I probably pushed her even further by moving her to a place where none of her friends were so she had some connections and then I, I pushed her out to the beach which wasn't my story but um, it's just how I, I moved that character to be a bit more extreme. Yeah so I think the last part of Kirsten's question was um, was it important to you to finish on a high note? Ah uh, yes yes so Dorothy Hewitt always said you must finish with a bit of hope and um, I did want to do that. Yeah. No, fantastic. It was a wonderful ending. 
So we've got a few more questions here, which is wonderful. Thank you everybody for asking such fantastic questions. So Joey says, is there anything that makes Sydney a particularly good location for a novel? <laughs> I guess for me, Sydney is just where I am. So it, it's where my books end up being set at the moment because it's, you know, very clearly in my imagination. Um, I think you can set a book anywhere, I'm not sure it matters, but Sydney certainly worked for me in this story because of the Olympics coming. Yeah, that's an interesting question, Joey, because it was something that I was going to ask you, you know, did you, could you see this novel being set anywhere else? And, you know, was it particular? I mean, you know, you, you had, you know, Harry spending a lot of time at the junction and, you know, on the beach and, mm -hmm. you know, obviously the, the Olympics had, you know, a big impact on this story. So I wondered if it, you know, could, could we see this story anywhere else? And I, I think you're saying probably not. No, yeah. Um, Mark asked that too from Spark Club Films. And um, yeah, I really feel this is a, a Bondi story, that that's yeah. part of the story is the location. Yeah, absolutely. Sue asks, do you have any favorite authors? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, Kate Grenville is, is a favorite. I haven't read her new book, but I'm looking forward to it. Um, and you know, I'm, I really admire Jackie French. I just admire that ability to write kids' books and gardening books and novels and historical teenage fiction. Yeah. I think that's really fascinating. Yeah, fantastic. Marie asks, to which writing retreats do you go and which would you recommend and with whom? Mm. So we don't go to writing retreats. We just get Airbnb or... <laughs> A motel. We fantasise about writing retreats, so if anyone knows any, let me know. I think there's a bit of yoga there. Um, but at this stage, I have a, a writing partner. She also has family. Um, she works in the film industry and, and wants to spend more time writing. And um, we know each other's stories, what we're working on. So it's a really good uh, relationship in terms of just being able to take a few days, give each other space, but also yeah. be able to talk to each other about this character or that part of the story. Yeah. It's a really um, important relationship, I think, it's really supported my writing mm. over the last few years. Yeah, that's wonderful. It's so important to find like-minded people and to find your tribe, people that you can talk about um, yeah. your, you know, writing issues with. And yeah, that's really important. Wonderful. Yeah, that feedback and support and encouragement to keep yes. going. Keep going. Absolutely. I hear you. Um, another question. How did the relationship with Spinifex Press start? Uh, Spinifex relationship started with my first book. And that was just very random me sending it to every publisher I could find. Mm. Um, I think I sent it out to 20 publishers yeah um and spin effects actually i got two offers for publication out of that 20 which i thought was pretty good at the time yeah um and spin effects were the ones i chose um so for this book i really i tried to have an agent for a while and she showed it to one publisher but that didn't work out with the publisher or with the agent so i sent it to spin effects and that's such a great organization you know they didn't um, want to publish the book in its original form but three of them sat down they all read it they all gave me feedback and they all said you know please go away and and have another go which is I think unusual for a publishing house yeah. and um, really wonderful for me that they were were wanting to see more that's brilliant a wonderful story what is your best advice for budding authors who may have ideas but don't know how to start and how to get published? Mm. So you, you've just got to do it and you've got to do it till you get to the end. I see so many fabulous writers who have the perfect first chapter and then nothing else. Mm. So, or that, you know, just never quite finish. So yeah. my theory of writing is, is really not to critique it until you've gotten to the end. So just write it. And um, often to ignore the first part, the um, you know, that first bit of writing sometimes is awful because you just don't know how to start. Mm. But you really just have to do it. You just have yeah. to start. With the book that I'm working on at the moment, I've hated the start for so long. And in this editing process, um, 
last week, I realised, well, that's not the start. The start is half a page down. That's the actual <laughs> start. It's just I had to write all that gunk there to get yeah. into the story. But then I just cut it out and now I've got a start I don't hate. So I think it's really important just to get the whole piece down because then you've got a solid work that, um, that you can start shaping and forming. And with publishing, gosh, I don't know, it seems like such a hard thing to achieve. And, um, and part of that process, I think, is getting used to people reading your work. Mm. I think I was really lucky with playwriting starting from such a young age that I, I was quite bold with my writing and, and not too afraid to show it to people. I mean, I still feel mm. nervous about it. Yeah. But I know it's part of the process and I'm willing to do it. And I know some other writers find that difficult to show their work and to take feedback on it. Yeah. What is it they say about the first draft? It's just you telling yourself the story. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and also we all have to develop very thick skins. Yeah. It's well, great if you know a lot. <laughs> and, you know, it's it's kind of opinion. The thing with uh, the feedback I got from Skin Effects was when I heard it, I thought, oh, yeah, they're right. Mm. I think if I heard that feedback and thought, no, I don't agree, it might have been really difficult, but yeah. sometimes you get feedback that resonates with you, that you kind of know is an area that needs work. Yeah, fantastic. Now we have one final question, and this has just been fantastic. Thank you everybody for your very thoughtful questions. So Jean says, what is your writing room like, and is it important to have a comfortable and or stimulating space to write in? Um, my writing room is really dull. <laughs> it's just a small workspace. Um, I, when we go away to write, I really love a view. You know, that's really lovely. Um, so I like a window and a bit of fresh air. But um, I, don't, I don't feel like I can pick and choose my writing space anymore. And, and I guess the more valuable thing is the time and space mm. to write in. Yeah. Well, Stephen King wrote under, in a corner for quite a number of years. I think he liked it like that. So <laughs> it really does depend on what um, inspires you or what um, makes you creative, you know, what, what gives you the greatest output. It's not I do find I like a bit of nature to look at, but that yeah. would be my preference. But yeah. I know the person that I write with, she gets a bit distracted, so she prefers less stimulating. Yeah. Totally understand. So, Sarah, I think that's it for all of our questions, but I wanted to ask you, what would you like readers most to take away from your beautiful novel? Hmm. I think I'd like um, a bit of pleasure and distraction, give them that, and then perhaps just a bit of thought about other people around them and, and what might be going on for, for people that they pass in the street. But that, don't necessarily see um, and I think finally um, and more importantly um, to look around what we're doing as a society so what changes we're making that make it a lot harder for um, people who don't have houses now so if you look at the modern bus stop that bus seat no one's ever going to be able to sleep on it and that's how it's been designed. That's you know a purposeful design, and feels a little cruel mm. to me. That, that as a society, this is kind of the way we're going. Yeah. No, thanks for that. I think we're just about out of time now. Um, if anyone else has any questions of Sarah and and didn't get a chance to ask them, you can you know by all means please reach out to Sarah on her website or via her social media channels. Um, I wanted to thank you, Sarah, and to Ramwick City Library for this opportunity to chat about your beautiful book. Mm -hmm.